What's up, guys? Paul Richards here, and we are in the midst of our esports and education online course. And in this video, we're going to be looking at the history. Oh, you can't really read that with the light. The history of video games. So if you're following along, this is chapter three. Let's get started. So it's important to think about the history of video games from an educational perspective so that students, teachers, coaches can all kind of understand where we are in time. So let me show you really quickly where we are in this course, and then we'll dig into a brief history of video games coming from the really the revolution of video games in the 1980s all the way to today where we've got free to play games that are taking over the industry. All right, so let's take a look at our whiteboard here. As you can see, we finished the first video about this course, and now we're going on to the history of video games. This is gonna be an awesome course. Let's get started. So video games have really become integrated into the lives of young people, old people, everybody you know, with a Windows computer. As soon as you get a Windows or a Mac or even a smartphone, there's likely a game on there. So there are video games integrated into our lives today. In fact, I read that something like more than 90% of Americans today play a video game every day. And when we're looking at esports and education, one of the statistics that I like to I write, wrote, write about in this book and bring up is that students over the age of 13, um, not many of them play sports anymore. 70% of them stop playing sports uh, with their athletic department. But 90% of teens today play video games every day. So this is the world that we live in. Welcome to the future. Let's take a look at the history of video games so we can see where we've come from and help students, educators, parents kind of see what's happened over the past 40 years, 50 years of video games in our culture. So we're gonna take a look at the history of video games today. Now, how has video games transformed from a teen pastime to an international stage, to an industry that's larger than the movie industry, that's larger than the music industry, okay? Video game industry currently in 2020 is estimated at valued at $140 billion. Okay, that's more than the movie industry, which is in roughly 130 billion, and the music industry, which is 20 billion. But this industry is growing way faster than either of those. And how has it gotten to this international stage? Well, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Now, esports in itself is the really the competitive version of esports. And now while when we study video games and we've you know, we've been humans have been studying video games ever since the video game revolution started in the early 1980s. Most average video gamers today have never been taught how to study a video game. And that's going to be an important theme throughout the book and our course is how can we kind of learn about the inner workings of games and better understand the complex video games of today? And in order to do that, we're going to draw on the rich history of video games for perspective. So the very first computer game ever made was called the Nimitron, and it was released at the 1939 World's Fair in Queens, New York. The inventor, Edward Conden, created the game based on an ancient mathematics strategy called NIM. NIM is a game where two players take turns removing sticks from a pile, and the object of the game is to force the other player to remove the final piece. Now, while early games like Nimitron may seem basic in comparison to the latest multiplayer online phenomenons that students and teachers and educators and kids are playing today, this is where it all started. Now, below me here, you can see OXO. This is the Nimitron over here. That's the original patented design. OXO over here was based on tic-tac-toe. So another game that's based uh, on to, to simulate a popular game in existence today. And one of the things we'll learn is that a lot of video games have been designed based off of other games, and it helps students kind of understand how they are put together. So OXO was created by A.S. Douglas in 1952, and in the early days of video game development, 
Most games were created by large companies and universities. This is because video games were generally being used to demonstrate computer power. So games were being created really for research to find out the modern limits of computer programming. Now, it wasn't until the 1970s that arcade games started to come out. And this was like the arcade game revolution. So in the 1970s, regular people were starting to buy and play video games made for the consumer market. And for the first time in history, um, video games were starting to really come into commercial uh, arcade places that people would go and play video games. Um, so throughout the 1970s and the 1980s, this became really popular. And in 1972, a company called Atari developed Pong. And Pong was the very first successful coin-operated uh, arcade machine. And Pong really broke new ground for, at the time, the very tiny video game industry because it was so much fun to play. It was a two-player game based, again, on an existing game called uh, table tennis, where you'd have one ball and two paddles. And it was very simple. It was just like that. And uh, Pong was based on that concept. And uh, the game consisted of two paddles where you'd hit the ball back and forth. And if a player let the ball pass them suc without successfully hitting it back, the other player would score a point. This, this was so significant in our culture that the Pong arcade machine has a permanent place at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. Now, one of my personal favorite games that I still play today is called Pac-Man. You guys have probably heard of it. It's considered one of the most popular and successful video games of all time. And this game, it was based on a maze. So again, mazes, right? There's nothing new about that in 1980. People have been making mazes forever. Corn mazes, different things. Basically, a concept of a maze is so so kind of ingrained in human history that, uh, again, it didn't come out of nowhere. This is based on a traditional game in history. And uh, the company Namco, who released the iconic game Pac-Man, um, it really took the world by storm. And the game developers wanted to create a game that would appeal to both women and men. And therefore, the game's characters were designed in cute, colorful colors, and they had fun-loving names like Pinky, Blinky, Inky, and Clyde. This game is super popular, and I still play it today. In fact, I bought one of the arcade one-up cabinets to put in my basement. It's really affordable, honestly. It's about $300 to buy one of those. And while the layout of the game is simple, it's very difficult to master. And that's what makes it so fun to play over and over and over again. In order to master Pac-Man, players must think strategically about each opponent, the ghosts, and learn their unique behaviors. Pac-Man is considered one of the most successful video games in the world, and it owes its success to its thoughtful design. And it's just really incredible what good design can do to a game. And understanding a game like Pac-Man and the design behind it will help students and educators kind of break down some of these more complicated games today by understanding the, the history of video games and where they come from. Now, in the early 90s, in fact, uh, 1988, 1989, depending on, you know, the country that you're talking about, Sega Genesis came out. I remember having this game as a kid. I remember playing Sonic the Hedgehog. I loved it. This was a huge revolution in video game technology. And at this, this period, video gamers were super excited because graphics had greatly improved and game developers had these solid platforms. Nintendo released SNES in 1990 to create new games for. And this was called the console market. It created a market where consumers could purchase these gaming stations and then slowly purchase collections of their favorite games. And there was competition in the market. You know, in the beginning, there was Sega and Nintendo and competition is great and it forced console manufacturers to innovate. New platforms from Nintendo, Sega, and then eventually, uh, many people know, PlayStation and Xbox started to come out. And this was really kind of like a, you could call it the golden age of video gaming. Um, by 1994, Sony had reportedly sold 102 million PlayStation console units. And by 2000, Sony had sold 155 of their PlayStation 2 units, which is uh, actually the world's most popular best-selling home console to date. Now, more recently, 
what has happened. Uh, we're going to talk about a couple of the more recent things is that video games have started to go online, right? Video games have started to become massive multiplayer online games. And uh, League of Legends is one that really is one to, to look at. In fact, over the past decade, League of Legends has transformed the online video game industry. And the first thing to understand about League of Legends is that it's free to play. Okay, they really changed the game with their free-to-play release model that included microtransactions. So yes, it's free to play, but they actually generate billions of dollars with microtransactions that allow gamers to purchase non-game, um, basically things that are not, don't, it's, it's not, uh, how do I say this? Uh, basically, it's free to play, but you don't have you can pay for things that are not essential to winning now the first thing to understand obviously it's free to play but it's very difficult to master the game consists of two teams of five who fight to destroy the opponent's base and um, use dozens of skills teamwork communication memory and mental agility the game was released in 2009 right and uh, at that time most games sold for 50 to 60 dollars a copy so League of Legends being totally free at that time attracted massive audiences with their free-to-play model, and they were able to maintain a high level of engagement with their game because they made it so difficult to master. While you'd think a game that's super difficult to master would deter players, it was actually League of Legends' challenging aspects that kept players coming back for years. It's still one of the most popular games in history 10, 11 years later. To keep the game increasingly challenging, the game's developer Riot Games uh, organized seasons for the game to be updated and changed almost like a traditional television network. And throughout each season, they would release a series of changes through a process called patch updates. And these patches would keep even the top gamers on their toes by changing the game and forcing players to rethink their strategies. With each season of the game, including massive tournaments and interesting changes to the game, high school and college level esports teams, which we'll talk about in an upcoming video in this course, follow each of these changes closely. Now, Riot Games has effectively changed the industry's thinking about how to keep in a game engaging over long periods of time with these game-changing patches, as opposed to what was normal during this time to have a sequel replacement for the game. And this trend has been adopted throughout the industry. But League of Legends does still make tons of money. It's free to play, but they reported $2.1 billion in 2017 just by selling aesthetic digital purchases to players online. And it's important to note that League of Legends is not a pay-to-win game. Nobody likes pay-to-win games. They've received very bad reviews from gamers in the past. All purchases are for non-essential game add-ons. Anything that's considered essential to the game is readily available to all players. So as you can imagine, League of Legends being so interesting to watch because it's so hard to play. And because the game is so complex and ever-changing, viewers can easily save time learning about the game by watching top player strategies on a live stream. The learning required to become an effective League of Legends player involves serious research into the complexities of the game. And this has made League of Legends one of the most popular games to watch online on YouTube, Facebook, and live streaming on Twitch. In fact, it's games like League of Legends that have helped grow the popular live streaming service Twitch. Live stream video game content is a really powerful source of training that allows gamers to interact with this online community, learn how to use new vocabulary, and gather skills necessary to master the game. And we're gonna talk about live streaming and how to live stream an esports tournament, but it's been so important to the video game industry to have massive audiences watching online. And it's really helped grow some of these games like League of Legends and Fortnite, which we'll talk about next, because massive amounts of people, you know, at one point, Twitch reported it had 140 million monthly users watching the platform. And it's just a win-win for everybody. Uh, everybody, all the gamers who are watching get to learn, the streamers are making money by monetizing their channels on Twitch. Twitch has a very lucrative, lucrative business model. And the video game developers themselves receive this massive amount of publicity online by having so many streamers stream their games online.
So the next and final game I want to talk about, really can't, can't have this conversation in 2020 without talking about Fortnite. And Fortnite was published by Epic Games in 2017 and again had that free-to-play model during its game release format, and it has lots of um, microtransactions, obviously. So while League of Legends transformed the multiplayer online battle arena genre of video games, Fortnite transformed the first-person shooter genre. Fortnite was originally launched in 2017, and here we are in 2020. It is the most popular game in the world. The game starts out by dropping 100 players onto an island where they fight until only one winner is left. The game achieved phenomenal success in a short period of time with its free-to-play model and its familiar first-person shooter style of gameplay. Fortnite sets a new course for this gaming-as-a-service market by offering new weapons, skins, and modes to keep gamers playing. Fortnite became incredibly popular with young generations of 12 to 13-year-old gamers who are attracted to this fast-paced style of gaming sessions. Fortnite benefits from its first-person shooter style because it's very familiar to huge audiences of established gamers. The almost overnight success of the game came down to a few basic elements. Number one, the game was free to play, and it's available on all major platforms, including mobile phones. Second, the game features a strong social experience that allows gamers to play with their friends that they know at school or other online communities. And finally, and lastly, the game is enjoyable to watch as a spectator. If you've never watched Fortnite being played, try it. Watch it on Twitch. It's fun to watch, and you get these personalities who explain how the game is going. That really drove the explosive growth. Now, just like League of Legends, Fortnite is very popular on Twitch, which exposes them to even larger audiences of casual gamers. Fortnite actually outgrew League of Legends in 2019, and through the process, it's my opinion that they stole a significant amount of the microtransaction market share. In 2018, League of Legends reported that the total revenue dropped from $2.1 billion a year earlier to $1.4 billion. Okay, that's $700 million less in just one year. During that same period, Fortnite became the world's most popular video game and grew to a record $2.4 billion in sales via that almighty microtransaction. Now, Fortnite has received a lot of press throughout its meteoric rise in the esports world. I would say parents from all corners of the world have expressed concerns about the game being too addictive. But despite some of that negative press about the game's addictive nature for kids, Epic Games announced a record $15 million in prizes for their 2019 Winter Royale event. The Winter Royale event was hosted in three separate weekends with $5 million prizes each. And as you can imagine, with that much money on stake, the absolute best Fortnite players in the world battered for, battled for victory on an international stage with huge online audiences watching. So in our next video in this course, we're going to be talking about the history of esports and how that works into the video game market. So stay tuned for that. That'll be our next video. I think that having a good foundation and a good understanding of the history of video games is crucial to anyone starting an esports club, anyone interested in bringing educational value to video gaming, is to understand that I, I really think playing those older video games, Pac-Man, Pong, to understand how those were based on real games that we played in history, how do we tie all that together? Well, we're going to be talking about that, obviously, in the book in more detail, and we're going to be covering the history and of esports next, so stick around. Let's uh, let's get going, guys.